Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, tech stocks rally slightly, but the sell-off drags on the Nasdaq for yet another consecutive trading day. We'll break down all the action. Plus, Amazon sends Slack a $9 billion message. We'll break down what could be the biggest acquisition to date for the world's largest online retailer. And a tech jobs bonanza unfolds in the UK, but the workforce can't seem to keep up. We'll dig into why filling them with the right talent is still a struggle. First, to our lead. Tech stocks started the day lower and made up some losses into the close. It's still marked, though, the fourth out of five days the Nasdaq has finished lower. Joining us now to discuss the recent sell-off, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle from New York. Abigail, give us the tech roundup. Thanks so much, Emily. And you know, it's really pretty interesting because you're right about that. In the morning, we did have tech down sharply, the Nasdaq down more than 1%, at the session lows down 1.4%. And then as the day went on, we saw the losses really being paired. Now, even so, the Nasdaq did finish down half a percent, but it really did, does seem that we saw at least a little bit of that buy the dip mentality uh, overall. But to your point about the last five days, the S&P 500 tech uh, index itself is down more than 3.5%. The worst five-day stretch, Emily, since uh, the Brexit last year. So some really big selling. Lots of the big names participating once again today. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Alphabet. In fact, Alphabet had the rare downgrade. Most of the analysts out there are bullish on this one, but Canaccord did downgrade it to a neutral on valuation. And that's really what's at play here, whether or not these high-flying stocks deserve to be high-flying. That's true too for the tech space you know we have the socks that chip index up uh, sharply over the last year up more than 55 percent lots of uh, big valuation there there have been a lot of guys on the street wondering when that sector would come down to earth and that seems to be happening right now with amd micron some of the equipment guys such as clack and amac giving it back to emily so even though those losses were paired at the end of the day it seems that that sell-off is still going on a little bit let's talk about snap now back to Basically, it's IPO price, one of the uh, more newly public tech companies. What's your take? You know, Emily, that's a really interesting one, and I think that's a real sign of the time. So we have this really hot tech IPO go off earlier this year. At one point, the stock was up more than 55% from that IPO price of 17. And then today, in the middle of this sell-off, and even as we see those losses being paired, it hits that $17 IPO price, so a real round trip there. And I think it speaks to the fact that investors are uncertain. Do they want to take on this kind of risk? Uh, you know, for the possibility of a continued move higher. That's not really the case necessarily with Snap, but still sort of abandoning uh, all the babies with the bathwater there with Snap included, Emily, today at least. And let's take a quick look at the chip sector coming back down to earth. Absolutely. So, you know, valuation here is the big play. At one point on a trailing basis, this uh, P.E. for the SOX had been up more than 30 times, the S&P 500 closer to 20 times. So people are wondering how long can this uh, sector just continue to fly? And we've really seen a big reversal. Andrew Left of Citron um, Research last week was a piece of this on Friday. He's not bearish on NVIDIA, but this stock, Emily, over the last 12 months, up more than 200 percent, a real ra rocket ride. He's saying that we need to see them show a little bit more, that it's a great company, but it's gone too far too fast. And on that, along with a Goldman Sachs note, we really saw uh, that sector come in and the selling continue and taking lots of the other names with it. NVIDIA actually finished slightly higher today, but the other ones came down. One last point, though, Emily. So even though we do have this tech sell-off on the year, the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100 are still up sharply, 17%. So it's going to be interesting to see whether the buy the dip that we saw a little bit today continues or if we are, in fact, going to see uh, tech just continue this sell-off. All right, Abigail Doolittle with the roundup for us. Thanks so much, Abigail. Now, for a broader perspective on the tech landscape, we're joined by Mitchell Green, partner at Lead Edge Capital, a late-stage investment fund with a billion dollars in capital under management. Lead Edge investments include Alibaba, Uber, and Spotify. So, Mitchell, what's your reaction to the downs that we've seen in tech over the last few days? Look, we take a very long-term view. Emily, thanks for having me on. And uh, look, you, you've seen uh, you know dips and you know dips and ebbs and flows in it. 
but you know, we still own a bunch of Alibaba and we literally take a 10 year view. I know it sounds silly, but we actually believe there's a huge opportunity to have time arbitrage. And you know, we think this is a, you know, could, could literally be a four to $500 stock in a decade, earning over, you know, $20, $25 per share, you know, and compounding at, you know, 24% a year Kager, which is actually very similar to what Amazon compounded revenue at over the last decade. When you look at valuations, tech valuations in the private and public markets, do you see that they're justified? <laughs> do I see that they're justified? In some cases, yes. In many cases, I, we think their stuff is still very expensive. Look, you know, there was a sell-off a couple of years ago in 2005, early 15 in a lot of the software space. The so stuff came down. But the reality is there's too much money chasing too few great companies. And so those companies, if you're, you know, if you're growing super fast, you can still command a very premium valuation. In terms of public stocks, stuff is definitely not cheap. I mean, there, are, there is a class of companies that are cheap, but we would argue they're, they're pretty garbage companies. Um, but you know, people are willing to pay up for growth and in a zero interest rate environment. Well, what are you going to own? Right. Do you see current market conditions impacting IPOs, impacting deal making? So it, it's it's really interesting that you asked that. So I was literally at lunch uh, a couple days ago with a friend, and we were talking about we cannot believe that there is not literally an IPO every other day because the market can't get any better than it really is today. Like it's it's incredible that there's not more. There are a couple companies about to start, you know, that have they're filed. You know, usually indicates that they're about to go out. Tintry, Blue Apron. Uh, we're in this. We're an investor in a company called Delivery Hero, which is about to start. Um, but no, it's uh, it surprises us. There's not more activity. On the delivery hero subject, you're also an investor in Blah Blah Car. Do you see a difference in European versus U.S. valuations? We do. There's, there's frankly just less capital in uh, in Europe to in you know, looking at all these opportunities. Uh, we also think there's another interesting thing in that we, we're in, we're going to be encouraging more of our European companies to actually go public in Europe because there's a very interesting phenomenon. If you look at some of the, you know, there's very little growth effectively in European public markets. So if you look at the Frankfurt Exchange, the you know the London Exchange, the you know the exchange in, in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, where um, you know, if you look at um, you know some of these companies like Just Eat, which competes with Grubhub, it's like the you know the Grubhub of the UK, or you look at Takeaway, which is public in, in the Netherlands, these trade at substantially higher multiples. And the reason for that is a lot of these European pension funds and sovereign funds, you know, different insurance companies over there have to invest in European equities. So we're actually encouraging these companies to go to go public over in Europe. Now, you got into Uber at a $40 billion valuation. Have to ask you, what's your take on Travis taking a leave of absence from the company and the incredible cultural challenges they now face? Absolutely. Look, that's a hot topic uh, right now. I think it's important to, one, remember on the leave of absence, Travis, you know, did have a very, you know, uh, is that a, a horrible, with the personal going on right now, obviously his mom very unfortunately passed away suddenly and his dad is in the hospital from a boating accident. So I, I frankly think a lot of the, uh, leave of absence is a result of that. Um, we are big believers in Travis. We are big believers in founders remaining at companies. Look at like Bill Gates from Microsoft, uh, Larry Ellison, Oracle, uh, Sheryl Sandberg bringing in, no, sorry, Mark Zuckerberg bringing in Sheryl Sandberg, you know, the Google guys bringing in Eric Schmidt. We believe founders should be at the company and we think, you know, Travis is a visionary. He's built a service that, uh, that really people around the world can't live without. Um, the, it's amazing. People want to go from point A to point B, get there fast, get there cheap. Uh, we think there's huge upside in Uber from here. Are you a big believer in Uber sustaining its valuation, though? They last raised at $70 billion. Now there are concerns that the brand has taken a huge hit and that they won't live up to that. So, you know, they, they release, you know, to the press, they've started to release to the press, um, you know, some of their numbers, you know, as you know, the Q1 numbers were very, very strong. And all of this started with the very unfortunate news about the sexual harassment stuff, which is absolutely horrible. You know, it's horrible. They need to make changes. It's great to see the board making changes. Uh, and I think they'll continue to, you know, make, uh, make more. And I think they're, you know, uh, you know, I think they're continuing to bring in, you know, world-class people. Um, you know, David Richter, I've, you know, who's going to be one of the number two guys there, is, you know, we've heard from numerous people, is absolutely phenomenal. And um, I, we, believe, we believe in management, we believe in the board. 
You're also an investor in Alibaba. Bloomberg News is reporting now that Jack Ma may participate in a $1.5 billion investment in the ride-hailing company Grab, which is Uber's competitor in Southeast Asia. This along with SoftBank. To any extent, a bet on one of Uber's competitors is a bet against Uber. How do you reconcile that? That's fine. They invested in Lyft a few years ago as well. And uh, it, it, I think they're actually pretty darn good. They get a lot of us, you know, a lot of people give them a lot of, you know, grief about some of their investments. But, you know, I think they, they invested in Lyft several years ago, and I actually think they'll do quite well. Look, I'm, I, we, we frankly think Southeast Asia um, in the, in, in the you know, ride sharing space is, is a huge, there's just too much capital going into it right now. Um, we are also actually looking at Grab um, as we speak. Um, and uh, you know, we think that we think the market opportunity is enormous there. And the fact that Jack and Alibaba are looking at it doesn't surprise us. They want to continue to expand, you know, especially in the capital investing side outside of Asia. All right, Mitchell Green, partner at Lead Edge Capital. Mitchell, thank you so much for joining us. Well, Facebook debuted a new blog today called Hard Questions, which will address philosophical debates about the role of social media in society. The first post highlighted the fact that the company hired more than 150 counterterrorism experts and is using artificial intelligence to try to keep terrorists from using the social network. The company acknowledges political pressure in their post, writing, although academic research finds that the radicalization of members of groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda primarily occurs offline, we know that the internet does play a role and we don't want Facebook to be used for any terrorist activity whatsoever. Coming up in a newly relaunched Business Week, Apple CEO Tim Cooks takes the cover story. We'll dig deeper and look at what he had to say about politics and more next. This is Bloomberg. The price of Bitcoin tumbled Thursday, putting the digital currency on track for its worst week since January 2015. The retreat comes after the price almost tripled in value this year. Other digital coins are also falling after Coinbase, the digital currency exchange, suffered an outage Monday due to high trading volume. Well, for 88 years, Bloomberg Business Week has covered the companies, people, and products that have shaped and reshaped the world's economy. But just as the business landscape has evolved, so has Bloomberg Business Week. Today, Bloomberg relaunched its magazine with a whole new look, feel, and editorial direction. This week's cover story features Apple CEO Tim Cook. We are joined now by Bloomberg Business Week editor Megan Murphy. And Megan, you spoke to Cook. You flew in for WWDC and sat down with him right after we did on sure television. Did. I'm curious what your impressions were of Mr. Cook. Well, Emily, as you know, you know, we did the interviews almost back to back. And what I was fascinated by is I think some of the things you've touched on was I think the big surprise at the actual conference was in introducing the HomePod, obviously, the what everyone thought was going to be the rival to sort of the echo and moving into that space very aggressively. But how focused Tim Cook was on the music capability of that new speaker as opposed to, say, its Internet of Things, its, its, its ability to integrate into your home. And I thought it was quite, quite interesting and quite humorous how focused he was on saying it was going to be the kids are going to be rocking, it's going to be banging with the new speaker. Very passionate about just owning that specific segment. And it ties in, as you know, with so many things about Apple. And, and he said to you as well, you know, we're not focused on being the first in so many markets, but we are certainly focused on being the best. He also talked about politics, and I felt fairly sincerely the pull quote on the cover of the magazine is, America is more important than bloody politics. What did you make of his strategy in terms of dealing with President Trump and the administration? Yeah, I mean, we should emphasize, too, that he was using bloody there in what I call the English sense of the word bloody, meaning, you know, it's sort of a shorthand for you know, ridiculous, you know, ridiculous politics and that America is worth more. He was very passionate, very eloquent, very genuine on this point. As everyone knows, he's had tremendous differences with the administration on their policies on things like climate change, on their policies on immigration, on their stance on LGBTQ rights in terms of bathroom laws, et cetera. But what he was saying was that on issues where they can find common ground, things like jobs, things like a resurgence of manufacturing in America, things like how they're going to reskill and upskill the workforce that they need to really drive forward innovation in the tech sector, not just at Apple, 
but across the country and, and, and communities that really need new jobs, new movement upwards up the social ladder. He's going to try to find ways to have his voice be heard and be a positive contribution. He said again and again how much he takes his responsibility as the CEO of an American company very seriously and that he will do his best to try and make an impact along those lines and work with, not against, the administration. Now let's talk about your responsibility shepherding Bloomberg Business Week into a new era. What is your big vision for this relaunch? Look, you know, we've done a lot of things with this relaunch. First and foremost, we've really streamlined and simplified the design of the print magazine, which most people are familiar with, to really showcase the journalism. We want that to shine through. Business Week has always been the really greatest outlet, consumer outlet, for the amazing journalism that you do, that all of our other correspondents and analysts across our 120 countries do, and we want to keep that focus. But at the same time, we're layering on additional digital products to allow us to get to people wherever they are, whenever they are, to be able to consume the product. So whether that's on an app, whether it's on our redesigned vertical, whether that's a newsletter format, whether that's through events, whether it's through TV like we're doing right now, we want Business Week to remain the sort of identify of, of the best in business and finance, technology, political journalism that we have out there. So it's really about the journalism making it easier for the reader and really making it stand out, making it pop, and frankly, making it relevant on a daily as well as a weekly basis. All right, that issue out today, also a redesigned app, definitely worth checking out. Megan Murphy, Bloomberg Business Week editor. Megan, thanks so much thanks for stopping guys. by. Coming up, you can hear more from our Business Week reporters every Saturday and Sunday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Coming up, we're going to talk about Amazon's interest in Slack at a potential $9 billion valuation. This is Bloomberg. A merger between FanDuel and DraftKings has been in the works for quite some time, but the deal could be blocked due to serious competition concerns raised by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. The combination of the two fantasy sports companies would give FanDuel and DraftKings almost more than 80% of the market. For now, to block the deal is just a recommendation by some at the FTC. The decision will still fall to the agency's commissioners to vote on. The vote could happen in the next week. We spoke to DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins just last month. Here's what he had to say about merging the two companies. So far, it's been going great. Um, we've been having regular integration strategy meetings. Um, we've also been getting the team introduced to each other and used to working together. And uh, I've been incredibly surprised in a very positive way at how well the team has gelled. Now to a Bloomberg scoop, Amazon may be looking to acquire the messaging startup Slack. The price range being discussed values Slack at about $9 billion, a hefty price for a company that was valued at about $3.5 billion in its last public funding round back in April 2016. If this does work out, the deal could be the largest acquisition to date for Amazon by far. Joining us now for more from New York, our Bloomberg Deals reporter, Alex Barinka. Alex, first of all, talk to us about what we know. So we, what we know right now is that Amazon is one uh, of at least uh, one other company that has expressed interest in acquiring Slack at this point. Um, my colleagues, uh, Alex Sherman, Eric Newcomer, and I broke this story late last night. Um, my colleague Alex Sherman has also heard that there is at least one company that's further ahead uh, that has kind of put pressure on Slack to engage in these talks uh, right now, engage in this inbound. And if Slack doesn't, then they are potentially looking to move on uh, because you know look this is a big sticker price nine billion dollars is where the discussions have been uh, circling around in terms of this acquisition so that's kind of uh, where the play is right now Amazon being the interesting one because frankly a lot of the folks in the tech industry I spoke with today just kind of feeling out what they think about the story this was not necessarily the first company that came to their mind Right. Amazon obviously has AWS, which caters to businesses. They've got their own video and audio conferencing service called Amazon Chime. 
How would Slack fit in? Slack, if you think about Amazon's future uh, aims with Chime, with some of their business goals, it kind of uh, looks twofold. You can look over on the actual uh, kind of consumer selling into business side, right? If, if there is an Echo in every business, if there is an Alexa in every business, then this could potentially be something that integrates into that, um, also integrates into selling into businesses, which is something that Amazon has been pushing further into. On the more tech side, which does lump in uh, closer with that AWS cloud business, Slack is kind of uh, the definitive developer chat uh, system per se. So when you think about integrations there, it does make a lot more sense in, in terms of the pure play enterprise business side. Because if you have folks who are uh, working on an AWS platform, who are building their applications there, then perhaps you have Slack as an easy communication tool that kind of just fits in with all of it. Now, Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield was recently on Bloomberg Television, didn't indicate any plans for an exit anytime soon. Take a listen to what he had to say. IPO would be years away. We're growing at a pretty fair clip still. Um, and one of the things that uh, side effect of that rate of growth is that predictability is hard. So the, not the kind of predictability that they would want in the public markets. But the good news is that the private capital markets are very friendly to companies like ours right now. And so there's no need for that public offering. Last quick question, Alex. Does Slack want to sell? Stuart, this is his baby, but you know, frankly, I've been around this deals environment long enough to know that everyone has a price. And when you think about how quickly this company has fired up and how big of a price tag this is, uh, you'd think a person would be foolhardy to not at least think about it. All right, Bloomberg's Alex Barringa, great scoop from you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Coming up, Cisco Executive Chair John Chambers says the tech scene in France is stronger than ever. We'll bring you his comments from the Viva Tech Conference in Paris next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Formal Brexit talks will begin on Monday as planned. That decision was made after discussions in Brussels. There were concerns that negotiations might be put on hold after Prime Minister Theresa May's Conservative Party lost its majority in Parliament. President Trump is expected to announce tomorrow he's rolling back parts of the Obama administration's plan to reset relations with Cuba. People familiar with administration discussions have said the president plans to impose new limitations on commerce. Greece's creditors agreed to release $9.5 billion in new loans for Athens, capping a key chapter of the country's bailout and ending months of uncertainty. It comes after thousands of elderly demonstrators protest to further pension cuts imposed by their government. In Washington, police issued arrest warrants now for Turkish security agents linked to a violent altercation last month. The alleged incident happened May 16th when Turkey's President Erdogan visited Washington. Video footage showed security guards and some Erdogan supporters purportedly attacking protesters. And in Virginia, despite the shooting that critically wounded Congressman Steve Scalise, the annual congressional baseball game is still a go. The first pitch is at 7 p.m. Eastern time. You're looking at a live picture right now from the field as members of Congress warm up and get ready for this important bipartisan effort. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Thursday here in Washington. Already 7.30 Friday morning in Sydney, we are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Happy Friday to you, Paul, and good morning. Good morning, Elisa. Yes, it's uh, looking like a happy Friday on the markets too. We're seeing some modest strength with the Nikkei futures at the moment. And we're waiting on the Bank of Japan monetary policy statement, which will come at the conclusion of this uh, two-day policy meeting from the Bank of Japan, looking out for any clues on inflation outlook there. Uh, here in Australia, ASX futures are also looking pretty strong, up four-tenths of one percent. Uh, we will, of course, uh, be watching BHP closely today. Uh, the world's biggest miner will announce 
announce a new chairman before the close of business on Friday. The Aussie dollar has been in focus recently. It spiked briefly above 76 US cents on Thursday. That is the best rally we've had since January, and that was on the back of some very strong employment numbers. Uh, but we do have weak wages growth uh, still to contend with here in Australia, and iron ore prices weighing on the currency. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. Technology, I'm Emily Chang. We are returning to our top story, the tech sell-off. U.S. stocks retreated today as large cap names in tech continued their recent slide, weighing on the overall market. Joining from New York for further analysis are Bloomberg Stocks reporter Oliver Rennick and ARK Invest Internet analyst James Wang. James, you think tech is undervalued. Where and why? Well, just to give one example, if you look at Facebook, Facebook is growing the bottom line uh, at over 70%, but it's only priced at PE just under, um, under 40. So adjusted for growth, its actual peg is like 0.5. The market is like 2.5. So you could say that it's one-fifth um, the price of the general market of the S&P. Um, that's a bit controversial, but um, I'm not afraid to be a bit controversial here. I think it's actually the right call. And Oliver, as I understand it, you disagree. Why? Yeah, well, actually, there's a really interesting point James brings up. Um, I think overall, when you take it from a sort of sector or macro level, it's hard to say the tech is not overvalued as a sector. I mean, uh, if you just actually uh, jump into the terminal, I've got a chart here that's basically looking at the tech index versus various other uh, metrics. You can see the white line is tech. This is normalized back to a year. Obviously, tech is beating not just stuff like energy stocks, which have gotten hurt, but their, in terms of the relative value next to the S&P that's in the bottom panel so you can see that tick down on the bottom panel there kind of shows you what we saw this little bit of a correction but what I think is interesting is even next to its growth peers uh, tech is still pretty expensive um, to James's point though the peg ratio is an interesting way to look at it because essentially what that does is take earnings growth into account and it is indeed a little bit of a different story if you just break down the sectors there's really only other two two or three other sectors in the S&P 500 that have a lower peg which is a good thing in this case uh, so the point there to be made is that look if you're if you're looking for growth and you want that earnings growth then people are willing to pay up for it I think James what do you think is impacting the sell-off and how much does it have to do with the Fed you know I don't think it has much to do with the Fed um, if you're put if you put yourself in the shoes of Reed Hastings or Elon or or Jeff I doubt that they've spent so much as 30 seconds in the past week thinking about Fed policy um, they are entering new markets and markets that have secular growth and they have very clear strategies that's not dependent on any kind of central ba banking policy. So uh, I don't think it's really have anything to do with the Fed. Um, I think it's probably the optimism that's been built into the market. It's been on pretty much a steady growth trajectory this year. And it's healthy, I think, to have a correction once in a while. Uh, bull markets die in euphoria and I prefer, you know, the bull markets don't die and we go, we go st slow and steady. Oliver, dig into some of the specifics here and the biggest losers in the sell-off, Tesla, Snap, Apple. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think those probably those particular ones, you look at Tesla, you look at Snap, these are some of those companies where perhaps there's not earnings or any therefore that the investors are looking for. It's more about the expectations for their growth. So that means that they get to be some of those really highly valued uh, stocks. So if you have a bit of a correction here in the market, whether or not it's due to those valuations, sometimes perhaps some of these investors will look at their uh, lineup of companies and say, look, I need to take a little bit off some of the top here, the top line ones. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look sector-based, uh, some of these semiconductor stocks, um, these are the ones that have actually been really lagging. Uh, you look at uh, Symantec, you look at uh, AMD, some of those today were one of the ones on the downside. And it's actually, if you, it's not necessarily all about valuations. I think a lot of it is sort of the thematic investing and the uh, kind of uh, momentum, if you will, that picked up really in the past about six months or so since the Trump trade kind of stopped. It was the Trump trade and that kind of gave way to a momentum trade. A lot of these companies are mixed up on there, and they just kind of got sold off. Perhaps, perhaps it's quantitative as well, because uh, these are companies that definitely fit into some of these factor models for sure. So, James, where do you see the market heading, the tech market specifically heading later this year? Um, we, you know, in, in times like this, when you have a bit of sell-off, I think it's it's good to zoom out and have a look at the, at the broader trend. I think if you uh, if you do that, you'll see that the, the 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 growth is actually quite sustained. I think some of the core fundamental technologies are actually 
just getting started. Um, if you think about deep learning and artificial intelligence, uh, we've, we've been having a lot of media on that right now, but that core technology is actually just maturing. And I think at maturity, that could generate you know, multiple trillions of new market capitalization for the, uh, for the S&P 500. Um, and the other, I think, really exciting area that's also had a really interesting sell-off, of course, is blockchain. The crypto space is, uh, is borderline at a, at a frenzy right now, and it's, it's had an even more brutal correction today. But that technology is also maturing under the hood. So I think long-term investors really need to look at the underlying technology to see where that is and um, to buy it at a, at, a, at a reasonable price. Now, Oliver, you sent me a chart, which I'm taking a look at here on the Bloomberg, Will yeah. Earnings Save Tech. Uh, tell me what's going on here. I, I like this. This actually fits kind of well into what James was just saying, because uh, I'll, I'll kind of connect two points, if I will. I think the point is that if you're sort of banking on some of these disruptive technologies or plays and some of these companies to sort of more move into the more mature stages of their life cycles and start producing earnings, that's what you see if you look at the estimated earnings per share growth for this year in tech. That's in the white line there. You can see how much that has changed in terms of analysts upping their uh, earnings expectations. Right now, apart from energy, which is mostly a situation of uh, favorable comparables, tech is actually poised for the most earnings growth over the next year uh, relative to its sector peers in the S&P 500. Of course, there's a bit of a caveat to that because when there is such high expectations, there's obviously room for error as well that's increased there. So a lot of this is going to be about whether or not some of these revisions for earnings, I think, come down as some of the economic data weakens a little bit, but at the end of the day, as long as they'll stay there, I think you'll see investors probably come back to them. All right, Bloomberg's Oliver Rennick and ARK Invest analyst James Wang, thank you both for a hearty debate uh, this afternoon. Coming up, the UK's tech scene is showing no signs of slowing down, but do they have enough tech talent to keep the party going? More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. How do you walk that line when you're in the middle of a crisis situation? It's really all about enabling people. Technology needs to serve everyone. But at the end of the day, it's all about emotional decision. I think there's huge innovation left in music. The hallmark of a truly great leader is that great is never great enough. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. France's startup scene is gaining traction against the backdrop of booming investments by venture capital funds. In fact, VCs invested $2.7 billion in the country last year. Cisco Executive Chair John Chambers joined Bloomberg Daybreak Americas from the Viva Tech Conference in Paris to discuss why he is so optimistic about business in France. Two and a half years ago, I said France would be the next big thing. And all my friends in the U.S. said, John, France, business, that doesn't make sense. A year and a half ago, I said France would become the startup nation in Europe. People again said, I don't think so. It actually is the startup nation in Europe. They went from an average of about 130 companies being funded by venture capital and high tech per year to last year 226 to this year 486. There is a excitement going on here, which the new president is only even amplifying further. And I don't think people at grasp how great the opportunities are. You haven't seen anything yet, yet in terms of what's going to occur in France. I think France will lead Europe in the digitization evolution and transition, and I think they'll actually lead Europe in the transition for the next generation of Europe. So I'm extremely bullish on France, and it is going up dramatically just versus 12 months ago, and 12 months ago I was very optimistic. Well, John, let's talk about the reality of labor market flexibility. It certainly doesn't lead Europe there, and it certainly sure. doesn't leave the Western world there at all. The challenges for President Macron are pretty big. Do you think he can achieve that? And for someone that has run Cisco and is now the executive chairman, as you look at the company, to invest in a sure. place like France, how difficult is that with the labor laws that currently exist? Sure. So I think what you have to look at is three things. First, I had the chance to get to know uh, the President Macron uh, when he was uh, Minister of the Economy. Uh, I've probably uh, been on sessions with him in front of MBA students at schools. We've done joint press uh, interviews in terms of Cisco's commitment to the country. I've had a chance to watch how he's evolving. And if you watch the momentum, and it was started with the prior government, they are a country 
country that I think is going to disrupt others. I'd be very careful to judge France. The France you and I knew is a great place to go for a vacation and have a great dinner. France is a great place to have business. Does he have two areas he's got to address in terms of tax uh, regulation and law and uh, the uh, also the social issues from a labor perspective? Yes. Am I optimistic that he will bring the whole country with him? Oh, yes. And I just came off stage with three hot startups from Europe. You would have thought not only were you in Silicon Valley with the three uh, startups that I interviewed, one from France, one from Israel, one from Germany, but you would also realize how much faster Europe is moving than the U.S. in terms of new startups and uh, the yeah. generation of jobs from those. So I'm actually very optimistic about uh, what President Macron would do. Uh, I think he will be a st very strong leader. Cisco Chairman John Chambers there. Meantime, the UK tech scene is flourishing. More than 10% of new jobs created in the UK this year have been in tech fields. This according to a newly released report from the job listing and recruitment portal Indeed. Expertise in AI and data science were two of the primary drivers, showing almost 200% growth and a 136% increase, respectively, since 2015. Still, filling these positions is proving tough. The report found that the 50 most difficult roles to fill of those 44 percent were for software and tech developers. Joining us now from London, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. And obviously, Caroline, there's a lot of uncertainty that businesses are facing, tech businesses especially in the UK right now, given Brexit and concerns about the economy, yet they're still looking to hire. You're right, one in 10 jobs is going to the tech sector here in the UK and that's notable because it's more than the financial sector and that really was the sector that the UK over depended upon for years prior to the financial crisis and also more than professional services. So this is a key area of growth. You were saying the numbers almost double the growth in the past year that we've seen in AI in particular and that sort of reflects the trends we're seeing across technology in general with Apple pushing on Siri, Google pushing on Android, Amazon pushing on echo AI machine learning is where it's hot so too is just developers in general a lot of the st numbers are coming from junior jobs but there are the hardest ones to fill are the more senior ones Emily and interestingly I think it's gonna be a harder and harder sell as the pound crumbles in its value and suddenly EU workers perhaps don't want to come quite so much what trends in hiring are people talking to you about in terms of what kinds of jobs they're looking to fill yeah, I think it is at the moment developers, 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 engineers, that's what they're wanting. I think what's an interesting theme is how many are now looking to source that sort of talent actually abroad. Do you really need your engineering talent to be based in the London, in London, which is quite expensive to do? Or could you perhaps be looking to the Philippines, to Lithuania, to some of the Eastern Bloc countries where we know that there's rich pools of talent and, and they're pretty cheap to come by? I mean, we know that TransferWise, one of the pin-up fintech companies here in the UK yes has a bulk of its talent here in the United Kingdom and they're headquartered here but also they look to Estonia where the current owners and indeed the current founders of the business come from originally so many are looking at talent pools to come from abroad and I think this is what is also slightly worrying is I was just at Founders Forum today this is where some of the leading lights in UK but even US technology gather Marissa Meyer was there for example David Cameron the ex-UK Prime Minister was there giving a speech and a lot of people I'm talking to are saying they're worried about EU talent currently based in the UK wanting to go back home. The pound has fallen in value. They're worried about whether they'll be able to retain their visas and indeed their citizenship here. All the time though, many saying, look, maybe it's not too much of a problem when you've got the US, you've got India, other talent pools to call upon. But I do think that tech talent is still the number one priority for those founding business in the UK. And the question is, can they get enough of it here, particularly amid the Brexit and post-election uncertainty? All right, Caroline Hyde, thanks so much for giving us that context there from London. Coming up, the co-owner of the Tampa Bay Lightning broadening his investments and turning to eSports, why he thinks the industry is primed for a breakout. And a programming note, tomorrow Bloomberg Real Yield will be live from BlackRock's trading floor in New York City. Fresh off the Fed rate decision, Jonathan Farrow sits down with BlackRock's Rick Ryder, Jeff Rosenberg, and Pablo Goldberg. That's this Friday, 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.
Korean mobile games maker Netmarble surged the most in two weeks in Seoul. Netmarble's IPO last month was South Korea's biggest in seven years, raising more than $2 billion. COO Sungwon Lee spoke to Bloomberg from the E3 conference in LA. Take a listen. We want to be uh, more open to have um, uh, some small team, for example, to fill in some a specific area, so we are missing uh, in capability. And also we want to invest in some more IP collaboration, so to attract users more effectively in the United States. And so the marketing is very important, so we really want to invest in marketing technology side. Tampa Bay Lightning owner and chair Jeff Vinnick made a name for himself tripling clients money as a hedge fund manager at Fidelity. Now his latest bet is on eSports. He just followed, he just joined fellow team owners Peter Guber and Ted Leonis as co-executive chairman of the investment group Axiomatic. More commonly, eSports takes the form of organized multiplayer video game competitions and Vinick joins alongside Axiomatic investors including Magic Johnson, Steve Case and Tony Robbins. Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn spoke to Vinick about the potential for the industry. It's a very young industry and a, a rapidly growing industry. If you count the uh, the revenues of the game publishers, who uh, certainly uh, make uh, are very in good shape in, within the industry, you're talking many of billions of dollars. There's also opportunities in sponsorship, of buying uh, buying elements during the games, in media, etc. And revenues there, I believe, are approaching a billion dollars or more. If you look at the amount of money, though, for the 200, actually now about 300 million people worldwide who are playing e. Sports. A billion dollars divided by 300 million is about three dollars per participant in esports. If you look at an NBA fan or an NFL fan or an NHL fan, it's ten times as much. So we may not get to that level, but we think there's multiples of upside from where we are right now in terms of generating uh, revenue in the industry. Jeff, you're clearly a, a massive sports fan. Obviously, the owner of the, the ice hockey team, the Tampa Bay Lightning, you know, minority owner even uh, of, of Boston teams. I won't go into specific. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm just wondering, are you concerned that this kind of sporting event and this watching of other people playing sports, that it's a little bit like what Guitar Hero is to playing guitar, for example, that it's taking, it's taking away from sports, it's cannibalizing the real thing? Um. Uh, no, I'm not concerned about that. And, and if you actually look at the typical esports player or esports um, visitor or watcher, a very different profile that you see in traditional sports. Um, this is generally in esports a, a market that uh, the whole world of sports had not been tapping into previously. Uh, when we do our research uh, on these people, and um, you know, we're talking about uh, generally a demographic that's uh, really right where you want to be in terms of it's, it's probably 70 percent male. 21 to 35 years old, uh, college educated, above average income. This is a great demographic. Many of these, the, many of these, these millennials and younger, uh, younger people hadn't actually been traditional sports followers. So we think both have great outlooks. I mean, sports is fantastic. It's one of the few places these days where you can convene communities and, and show it on TV and other other media live. Um, that doesn't exist anywhere else. And esports, uh, you talk to the, the those involved etc uh, this thing has legs and it's 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 going it's going places yeah and I mean it's obviously in you know a, a, a huge number of countries worldwide as well this is another thing about esports that it's really a global industry already and yes. the CEO CEO of axiomatic I should mention uh, was formerly the COO of Mattel so he knows a thing or two about you know selling games and selling uh, toys and, and things to do for young people how many franchises do you think this 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 market can take you know it's it's a, and and thank you for mentioning Bruce Stein the CEO of axiomatic a very talented gentleman we have on board and you're right he does come from the consumer products from the entertainment from the video games industry uh, in terms of franchises uh, it, it's just not that simple there are a number of games uh, League of Legends being one of the most popular games worldwide worldwide right now and they are in the process actually of franchising in the US uh, other games like overwatch is doing the same but it's a whole spectrum about there 
there. And this is very early in the esports space. In terms of axiomatic taking advantage of that, we believe between the owners and the and uh, Victor and Steve and Bruce and all our different skills, we think that we're going to be able to play in the entire ecosystem of esports. It's uh, you know certainly through uh, teams like Team Liquid. It's through leagues, being a member of leagues, if not um, perhaps involved in the actual structure of leagues. It's media. It's mm. partnerships. It's sponsorships. Um, fans. Uh, this is wide open field, and we think Axiomatic is positioned with our leadership to take advantage of all aspects of this. That was owner of the Tampa Lightning, Jeff Finnick, now also co-executive chair at esports investment firm Axiomatic. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. All episodes are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.